Good morning. And uh, today on this Pentecost Sunday, we'll be looking at the story we find in Act 2 of the coming of the Holy Spirit. But firstly, a quiz. You saw three videos before this talk. Question is, who is the odd one out? Gordon Banks, the England goalkeeper in the 1970 World Cup against Brazil. Diego Maradona of Argentina in the 1986 World Cup. Or Alisson, the Brazilian goalkeeper for Liverpool in a game against West Brom last weekend? Well, the, the answer is Alisson, because he gave God the glory. Gordon Banks famously made the greatest save ever. It was seemingly miraculous. Jairzinho crossed and the greatest player ever and possibly the greatest ever team, Brazil 1970, Pele, headed down with power in the right-hand corner behind Banks. The goalkeeper dived behind him and scooped it free of the goal. It looked impossible, but it happened. And in an interview many years later, Banks described that save. He admitted as he dived, I thought it was in. He then saw the ball bounce behind the goal. And by his own admission, he thought to himself, Banksy, that was blank, 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 lucky. It was bleeped out in the video I saw. Diego Maradona, playing against England in a World Cup quarter-final, approached the goalkeeper, Peter Shilton, jumping for a ball that had bounced higher than either of them on a hard Mexican pitch. He jumped with a leading arm. He knocked the ball past the goalkeeper. It was well above his head. It was, frankly, handball. A fact the officials did not see, and the goal was allowed. When asked about it afterwards, Maradona, without shame, claims it was the hand of God. He lied. Alisson, last week, stepped forward uh, from his goal in the 95th minute. A corner to Liverpool with scores all square at one apiece. And Liverpool, with an eye on a place in Europe, next year needed all three points. The cross. The goalkeeper headed like a striker and goal. Alison, after the game, proclaimed that God had his hand on my head. He, Alison, gave God the glory for his blessing. According to Premier Christianity magazine, to highlight how unusual this is, in the history of English Premier League, spanning approximately 30 years, nearly 30,000 goals have been scored. Six have been by a goalkeeper. And Alison is the first to have scored with a header. In the high-profile world of football, Alison has faithfully honoured God. At the weekend, God honoured Alison. One was attributed to luck. Banks is save. One was a cheat, breaking the rules, but tried in effect to blame God. That was Maradona. The last one was a player recognising the unlikely and giving it to God, honouring him just as he had been honoured. For God can do the impossible. God never bends the rules, he makes them. God honours those who honour him. So today we celebrate Pentecost, a Jewish festival known as the Festival of Weeks. It's broadly 50 days after the Passover. That's where the name comes from. It indicates 50. The followers were gathered. Many other Jews from around the nations were in Jerusalem too. Jesus had told them to wait. They would be clothed with power. They were to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. And they waited. It's a well-known story if you've been around churches for any length of time. It's the birth of the church. It's the powerful start to the exciting, amazing stories we hear in the book of Acts. If you don't know the story, let's look at some of the key words that Luke, who wrote it, uses to describe the events. Wind, fire, amazed, all, wonders, but, and saved. So wind. The first sign that anything was happening was the sound like a rushing wind. You can't see the wind, but you can hear it and you can feel its power. You can see what it does. 
I remember walking my dog on the beach one day. I saw a seagull floating in the air, watching it closely. You could see how hard it was working against the wind blowing out to sea. When it stopped battling, it soared into the sky, away, carried by the wind. I couldn't see the wind, but I can sense and feel its power. The Spirit of God came with the wind and is like the wind. Next fire. It seemed to all the disciples, there were probably about 120 of them, that a flame came down and separated into tongues of flame flickering on top of their heads. God is often described as fire in the Bible. In the burning bush where Moses saw God, the bush did not burn up. In the destruction of the wicked cities, they did. God is a consuming fire. God is also a purifying fire. There's a story of a church group outing to a local silver manufacturer. The silversmith was refining the silver by heating it to extreme heat to remove the impurities. One of the party asked, how do you know when it's ready? And the answer the silversmith gave was simple. When I can see my face in it. That's what God's fire does. It purifies us until we can see Jesus' face in us as he makes us like him. The next word is amazed. The reaction of the Jews in Jerusalem is mixed. Largely, it is of amazement, bemusement and being perplexed. Largely amazement. Some made fun of them, but the rest were just amazed. They cannot believe what they were seeing or hearing. They came from many nations and these northerners, for they came from Galilee in the north, were speaking their languages that they could understand. Not only speaking, but proclaiming the wonders of God, the good and amazing things he does. When the spirit moves, people notice. The next word that caught my eye was all. The text makes clear that there were many disciples and that they were a mixed bunch, men, women. No one was excluded because of who they were. They were all filled. Peter gets up to speak and he emphasises this point by quoting a prophet, Joel, who had spoken God's word 600 years before. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. All people, sons, daughters, young men, old men, men and women, I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. In other words, they will hear from God and they will speak his words of encouragement to the church. That means that this is available to you and to me, whoever we are. Next word is wonders. Joel also predicted that there would be signs and wonders, things that only God can do, miracles. God does not break his own rules. But he is supernatural, so he does things we cannot understand or explain. He breaks our rules because our rules are not his rules. Our thoughts are not his thoughts, and he is good. The supernatural says only God can do that. Peter later told the crowd in verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. They had seen the amazing, inexplicable things that Jesus had done, healings, miracles with water and wine, feeding thousands with morsels, walking on water, raising the dead, all so that people would believe he was who he said he was the Son of God. Next, but, an important word in the Bible. It means that whatever came before in the story is about to change. It's a bad news, 
good news story here. This man was handed over to you and with help of wicked men, you put him to death by nailing him to the cross. That's the bad news from Peter's mouth. But God, it says in verse 24, here comes the good news. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. God raised him from the dead. That victory wins us two things. An eternal life, life after death, a life forever with God that we were made for, and a life in all its fullness. That is where the Holy Spirit comes in. It is the spirit of Jesus himself sent to guide, protect and cancel us in living the best life we can have here and now as he lives within us until Jesus comes again. Then he will make all things perfect. What a gift. What's not to like? So finally saved. You might be thinking... Christians bang on about salvation, about being saved. But what from? Why is that so important? Let's go back to the beginning. God created everything and it was good. He made us and it was very good. Then temptation came in through the lies and deceit of the serpent who represents the enemy. The story is right at the beginning of the book in Genesis. Adam and Eve fell for lies and cheating that led them to rebelling against God, breaking the rules. The created wanted to be the creator. Only this time the referee saw and due punishment was given. Not just a goal disallowed, but banished from the perfect game, thrown out of paradise. That was the beginning of sin. Not a fashionable word these days, but it means the things that separate us from the full life now and the eternal life promised to us because we are separated from God by sin. But that wasn't the end of the story. God sent a rescuer, Jesus. So we have a choice. Do we choose the cheating and lies of a stolen goal or do we accept the apparently impossible save? God doesn't do this as a matter of fortune. He he doesn't save a soul and say, God, you lucky deity. This is what he does. He saves souls and he loves us eternally. There is nothing we can do to save ourselves. Just believe in Jesus. Like Alison, give glory to God. Only God can save through Jesus on the cross. But save from what? Save from eternal separation from God and a life that is less than God made it to be. The opposite of saved, of course, is lost. But the Bible tells us that Jesus, the shepherd, looks for his lost sheep. The father welcomes home the lost son. He is waiting for us right now. And if you are listening to this and thinking that you want to have that, but you don't have it yet, what can you do? Well, Peter covered this too, because those around him were asking him and he told them in verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And the people then ask him a question when they heard this. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter gave them the answer, knowing that God had convicted them of what they did not have. Verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. So another word, repent. Turn away from the things that separate us from God. He will take them away. If that is you today, we would love to speak to you and pray for you. Contact us, text us, email us, connect with us, 
and we'd love to pray for you. God can work with distance. God can work with Zoom. He can work with all of this technology. Just get in touch. But what does this story in Acts say to today's church? Well, at the end of the chapter, we hear they devoted to the apostles' teaching. So learning more and more about Jesus. They ate together. They expected signs and wonders and miracles. They told others that of the awe that they felt by being in the powerful presence of the Spirit of God. And they are these wonders are given to point to Jesus, not for our consumption or entertainment, they're to tell others. They were generous. They shared all they had, including their hospitality, and they ate together all the time. They praised God, and they enjoyed the favour of one another. And all Christian believers are called to build one another up and to encourage one another. They were continuously filled with God's Holy Spirit. It wasn't a one-day thing, it was daily. Now, I was sent this quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones, which poses a question to all of us who believe. You may say, it happened when I was born again and my conversion. There is nothing for me to seek. I've got it all. Got it all? Well, if you have got it all, I simply ask in the name of God, why are you as you are? If you have got it all, Why are you so unlike the New Testament Christians? Devoted to the apostles' teaching, eating together, expecting signs and wonders, telling others of your awe, being generous, including in hospitality, praising God and enjoying the favour of one another. In that church, on that day, 3,000 were added to their number and the Lord wants to add to our number daily passionate disciples who make disciples being filled by the gifts of his holy spirit daily come holy spirit veni sancte spiritus ella agio numa come holy spirit let's pray Come, Holy Spirit, come like a rushing wind, come like a consuming fire, come. Make us the disciples you want us to be and make more new disciples. Fire us with passion for your kingdom, for holiness, for abundance and fill us anew. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come Lord Jesus, come.